Welcome everyone to the Minnesota Score Chapters webinar on getting things done in the gig economy. Our presenter is Craig Izad, a talented and well-qualified presenter and SCORE mentor. This is the fifth in what we're calling the Human Resources Series. I'm Diane McKeever, also a SCORE mentor and chairman of the Education Committee. And thank you so much for attending. Before we get started, a little housekeeping. This presentation is being recorded and you're going to receive a link to it uh, in an email, as well as the PowerPoint slides in the next few days. The email will also include links to the previous four HR presentations. If you have any questions during the presentation, please note them in the Q&A box, not the chat box. It makes it a little bit easier for us to answer them at the end of the presentation. So before we get started, just a little bit about SCORE. SCORE is a nationwide nonprofit organization. Click, Craig. Yeah, hang on. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay. It's a nationwide nonprofit organization affiliated with the Small Business Administration. We provide free, confidential mentoring and educational services like this webinar. Our chapter, the Minnesota chapter, has nearly 90 volunteers serving Manatee and Sarasota counties in Florida for more than 50 years. This year, we were awarded the chapter of the year for our region. We're very proud of that. SCORE has assisted over 11 million clients since, it, since its inception. So SCORE can help you in all stages of your business, whether you're thinking about opening a business. And that's many, probably half of our clients are people who have had an idea and think they might want to start a business. We can save you a lot of money and time by applying for a mentor, or maybe you've opened your business and you have some questions about that, or you wanna grow your business, or lastly, you're interested in selling or closing your business. Do not sell or close without a, a SCORE mentor. We have a team of professionals who can help you do exactly that. And again, save you a lot of money and time. Uh, we would recommend that you visit our website, minnesota.score.org. There you can request a mentor, find workshops like this or other webinars, locate podcasts. All of these webinars are recorded and are available on our website or more resources such as templates and other types of files. Lastly, we want to give a big thank you to our sponsors and community partners. You'll notice a lot of local banks on here. We have affiliations with them and can help you if you are looking for money. Without these folks, we couldn't do what we do and we thank them greatly. Now I am going to turn it over to our presenter, Craig Izzad. Take it away, Craig. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to close the door here because of the increased jet traffic into SRQ. Shows how, <laughs> shows how good of a job SCORE has done in uh, getting business done in this area. <laughs> so uh, my talk today is really going to be about how to get things done. Now, that's a very simple version of it. Um, but my take is that the main function of an entrepreneur or a so-called business person, people ask me, you know, what do you do? What are you? Well, really, you're an efficiency expert. We all hope you are. You know how to get things done quicker, maybe more inexpensive, maybe better. Uh, and, but you're also a general contractor. And although a lot of people might not think of themselves in that way, that is what it takes to get things done in today's world. Otherwise, you're just gonna get tripped up by the first thing that comes along that you can't do. And of course, most of us can't do everything. So a short introduction of myself. I, I like to think that my career has spanned mostly everything, but the best thing about it is that I've never had to work for anybody. And I don't know if that's pure luck or it's my aversion to uh, 
authoritarianism, probably more of the second. Uh, I'd rather work four times as hard and not have somebody tell me the wrong thing to do. If somebody tells me the right thing to do, I'm your willing volunteer. But uh, I, I've been in, in numerous um, ventures. Th these show some of them here. I was uh, part of a large um, soy milk making operation and soy ice cream and numerous soy products out of which grew some very large companies, including some names uh, you might know today after it was sold and transferred a couple of times. Uh, the center picture is quite old and it's when my wife and I started in retail and you can see we hand letter design. It sort of shows you uh, we are true start at the bottom types. There's even an ax in the picture there. Uh, later on, you'll see a, a better picture of, of what that business grew into. And on the right hand side is a famous Drexel Mac. If you can see the D logo on there, some of you that are more into trivia, especially Mac trivia, will know that the first Macintoshes went to certain college consortiums. So uh, I got a Drexel Mac from a teacher who didn't want it. The public couldn't get them. And that was one of those Macs with the famous signatures inside the back cover. Uh, that's a Mac and maybe an image writer printer from maybe a 300 baud modem and an external drive on the right. So, so most of us these days, it's not, we don't go into one career and stay in there our whole life. We have to do so many different things. And really this is where both the skills to learn about how to get stuff done by other people really uh, comes in. The internet has just sped up the process. People always went to others to uh, find out information, including of course, score. But in the current, um, with, the, with the internet, the advent of the internet, this now becomes sped up to an amazing degree. So just some quick examples of, of what I've done in my career using purely online help. I have no education in computers or anything related to computers. As people know, they weren't teaching that in the 1960s. Um, so I created a point of sale system for my retail shops in the late 1980s. And that was done using advice on AOL forums, America Online. As some of you know, America Online was a prelude to the internet. It was an online community and it did have some very, very good forums. And it's sort of where I really first caught the bug because I got involved in these forums, not only in learning how to script, and that's scripting is sort of like uh, programming for kids or programming for beginners. I call it programming programs. And uh, I ended up making a multi-user uh, point of sale retail system when hardly any existed uh, for my shop and then for two shops. And we even had them communicating by modem at the end of the day, dumping all their things, their bank deposits. And I was able to do this myself, which would generally be unheard of. Uh, I researched and filed patents, trademarks, copyrights. I still continue to help a lot of um, score clients and others uh, with intellectual property. Again, I have no training in it, but through online resources, books, and experience, learned how to do this. Um, I learned how to create websites. Of course, where else but the web could you learn how to do the web in 1994 and 1995? So being very early to the game, it was easy for me to just learn the basics. Anything did, nobody was going to criticize your website. If you created one, that was good enough. There were so few. The world beat a path to your door. And I started in 1995, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but one of my larger websites went on for 18 years, had millions of, of page views. Um, I learned about manufacturing new products, mostly in the metalwork, engineering, design. We'll talk about that. That's another place where I used contracted work. I should mention that just about any of these things were solely me and often solely me in my spare time. So none of these things involved um, overhead of very much, or offices, uh, multiple people. So I did learn the, the contracting part of the business. Um, in the 
about 2015, I decided to enter into tech journalism because I had gotten quite skilled at writing and at all subjects technical. And so I started a website, in this case, about flying cameras, what you know is drones now, but this was before anybody was into them and before people really, before there was any that were flying cameras. But it turned out the um, drone thing took off pretty big and I published uh, three best-selling books in there, uh, used Kindle to do it and sold thousands and thousands of books, which is a rarity, you know, it's, it's easy to publish a book, but to sell thousands of them and make money on them, it was a, a pretty neat accomplishment. Um, doing it all through Create Space, which is a Kindle Amazon owned for making hard copies and through Kindle Direct Publishing. And I also, uh, as Diane had mentioned, some of these businesses, I had to sell them along the way, or I decided to sell them to get into other things. And what better place than mentors, experience, advice, and online to learn about how to set the values for whatever you have. So that's just some of my experience. This is a picture of that, uh, that store that I showed you uh, with the hand-lettered sign. A little bit later on, as we added additions to the left, to the right, took over the upstairs, uh, improved the signage and uh, Im improved it. So this was uh, a business we ran for 20 years that was uh, brick and mortar, classic brick and mortar. Now I also uh, ran with it, we had large warehouses, so I would get into other businesses such as importing. In this case, these are Danish products I was importing. Uh, into the warehouse and the picture on the right, it was sort of my favorite part of work was to get out of the office and stand on our Komatsu uh, 15,000 pound, I think it was, uh, forklift. And in that case, um, hauling some wood stoves, which was actually a manufacturing company that we bought at SBA bankruptcy auction. So that's a whole nother story in itself. I should give in, in its own seminar someday, but we, we manufactured wood stoves. We imported them, we distributed, we sold them. We also did solar and other work. So let me get into some of the early experiences and then some of the more physical experiences uh, I've had with contracting work out on the internet. Um, so an early experience I had, when I first saw the internet in, in say 1994, 1995, I had been using America Online, CompuServe, and I had been into ham radio and CB and, and other technical um, hobbies previous to that. And so when I first saw the web, I knew exactly what it was. So it wasn't I didn't see the web and say, oh, this is cyber or something. This is, uh, you know, whatever they call it, cyberspace. This is something weird. This is something different. I immediately saw it for what it was, and that is communication. And um, I saw the possibilities. I, in 1995, I had a moment that I would call sort of a uh, MLK moment that when I first saw the internet, I, my first thought was, this must be illegal. Now, some people would say, why would you think that when you saw the internet? But if you realize how the world was before the internet, everything was very structured. Somebody owned this, somebody owned that, somebody published that. There was no level playing field. And although the internet may not provide a full level playing field, there was none of this ability for any of us to just all of a sudden contact anyone else, have resources, have all of this. It was a more of a doggy dog rat race, or you're going to, depending on your talents and your connection, uh, you're going to be able to find things. So when I first got on in 1995, I was still running uh, those operations with the wood stoves. And so my first thought was, let me start a website uh, about wood stoves. And there were two business models at the time on the internet. It, it might be somewhat similar today. There might be additional ones, but there were two business models that were either sell things, sell products, or do what we call a brain dump. Brain dump being... Um, 
illustrated by sites that are informational, forums, Wikipedia. Just tell the world what you know and everything will come from there. So I decided on the second because I had enough years of hauling tens of thousands of pounds around, my back was hurting. So I decided to start the encyclopedia uh, of, of wood stoves, we'll call it. And I called it hearthnet or hearth.com. So when I first started this, I looked up on my wall and there was a picture that I had gotten, my wife had sent it to me. It was a print by an artist who happens to do the covers for Byte Magazine. And some of you older folks might remember it was the magazine of computing, Byte Magazine came every month and I looked forward to it. And my wife had bought me a present of a signed print. And I was like, wow, that's a cool picture. In fact, that sort of represents um, what I'm gonna do online. You know, that I'm going to uh, meld computers to the information age with what we know about one of the oldest uh, mankind actions of fire. So online, uh, going to Byte Magazine's site, I found out that there was a uh, artist, his name is Robert Tinney, and he's the one who did the picture. I have it signed on there. And lo and behold, I found his little site with a couple of his pictures. In 1995, he was on Yahoo. There was no search engines of any sort. Uh, Yahoo was a library. It was listed. La Yahoo nor any other sites had spiders. They didn't have things to um, look at the web and go out and harvest it and bring it in and index it. Rather, they were just people that were looking around the web or that you would announce your site to, and then they would put it up. There was that few sites. We could count the sites really in the hundreds at the time. So I sent Robert an email and said, hey, you know, I have a printer drawing. I love that. I'm going to start this site. Can I use this drawing? I came down the next morning and there was an email from him, 1995. And he said, sure, Craig, you can use it. And the little picture on the right is a, a picture of his, uh, the original sort of image of, of HearthNet. And you, you have to excuse the way the web looked back then was very different. It was very much more text-based. And that's a whole nother discussion in itself, whether we're better off that way. I, I should say that sites like Google, they took that approach and they still take that approach that the simpler, the faster, the better. So that, that's a 1995 or 1996 uh, shot of, but of, of me using that graphic. But you can imagine how it sort of blew my mind to have like, wait, just overnight as I went to sleep, I got this permission that would normally, what would it have taken? I'll leave you to think what it would take to get that permission in the world before the online world. So that sort of opened up my mind to some of the possibilities. Now, here's another early connection. This is a couple of years later, as we can see by the 1999 versions of the uh, Macintosh. Um, I volunteer, do a lot of volunteer work, and one of the things I did back to them was for the Boys and Girls Club, and I decided to start and finance a computer lab for them, and they didn't have much money, but I was reading online how um, Steve Wozniak, Apple Computer, the Woz, people call him, or the Woz, um, had started in his garage a um, outfit like this. And he would take neighborhood kids and he would teach them the web. He would teach them graphics and he uh, would finance, uh, bought all the computers and bought software. So I went to his site. He had a site, maybe still does, <clears throat> called woes.org. So I went to woes.org and I sent Steve Wozniak an email and I said, Steve, I'm starting this computer lab and, you know, I really need like Adobe Photoshop. I need uh, Adobe PageMaker. I need some of the software that I want to teach to these kids. It's, it's very expensive. I said, could you tell me like how you uh, got a hold of this? Is there people with the companies or is there a clearinghouse that might provide it to nonprofits at a low price? And lo and behold, again, the next day, I get an email from the woes direct from him, not from his secretary, not from anybody else. And he says, Craig, that's great what you're doing. He says, uh, you know, I just went out and bought everything at full price. <laughs> if, if you know him, you know that's his style. He wasn't going to 
beg anybody for anything free. He says, but I'll tell you what, I'll send you a thousand dollars so you can buy another, you, know, you can buy a, a computer because that's about what each of these computers cost. And I ended up having quite an email exchange with them. It was very interesting. I had to remind them once or twice to send me the thousand dollars. And uh, it was interesting. He was a little too busy. He's too nice of a guy and he does too much for too many people. So he gets sort of, he was like, Craig, I took on too much. And he was down at Disney World with his family and writing me and he finally got the check. And somewhere I do have a scan of it with his signature. And, but again, that shows you little old me getting in touch with Steve Wozniak and whether he sent me a check or not, just the ability to get advice from him or an answer just showed me here's what the real possibilities are. Now, speaking of woes or Steve Jobs or Musk, some people are going to are going to say love him or hate him, you know, whatever you uh, whatever you want to think. The advantage that people like this have and that I like to think a little advantage that I have is I'm a generalist. I can't program a computer. Steve Jobs couldn't program a computer. I doubt Musk could program a computer. But they knew how computers were programmed and they knew people um, that could do it for them. They knew a little bit about everything. And some of them were also at the right time in the right place. At the beginning of all of this, there was great advantages to being in Boston or to being in Silicon Valley, or to being in Champaign, Illinois, uh, the home of the supercomputer center where um, Mosaic, the first web browser, and then Netscape was developed. Uh, there was a very few places in the United States where you'd be surrounded by people, where you could go to a local you know, Macintosh or Windows or DOS or, or computer club, and you would actually meet these people, all these people that later became famous would show up at these computer club meetings. And that's how some of these people first networked. When I was reading one of Musk's first history, a lot of it paralleled mine exactly up until about 1997. Like he, he had started a site and was gonna do a classified site. I remember when I was meeting with a programmer friend of mine, we were gonna do a classified site. And, uh, and then he just went on, but he happened to be in in the Bay Area where a lot of things opened up to him that might not have opened up to me being in at the time in the Philadelphia area. So, so one of the, the points I wanna stress is knowing a little bit about everything is a good thing. Knowing how to get things done. You don't have to learn, the way I like to look at it is, I know when something built looks good or is done well. I know when a piece of music sounds well, I can't make it so. Don't ask me to play that music and make it sound that way, but be a critic. And it doesn't mean to be critical of everything in a negative way, but have high standards and know what it takes to get things done. This allows you to make the decisions along the way as you contract work out, know what to expect, how much it should cost, what type of person should do it, and this type of thing. And of course, Steve Jobs is famously known for his appreciation of, you know, a fine piano, a fine motorcycle, uh, a fine cabinet work, this type of a thing. And that's really in the end, what created his ability to subcontract and to get work done. This is actually a picture of me uh, in the early days with one of my ham radio setups. Uh, the woman, girl, kid that you see there is now a mother herself, and she's an engineer and an environmental attorney for the Sierra Club. So uh, it's, it's been a few days. But again, some of this background in ham radio, in carpentry, I, was, I did carpentry and general contracting, which taught me probably more than anything else about the way to get projects done. And just a, a little bit about that was when I first started doing it, I did certain parts of it. Like I was hired on a job site to frame houses. I knew nothing about framing houses, but the other people could tell me, Craig, cut these boards to this length, cut, carry four of them over there. Then they showed me how to nail them together. 
But before long, I knew how to frame a house, but I didn't know how to put siding on a house. I didn't know how to do a kitchen. I didn't know how to do plumbing. I didn't know how to do electrical. But as the years went by, I went into the remodeling business. Customers asked me to do larger jobs. And I was seriously quite afraid. Um, it, was, it was intimidating. Somebody said, build an addition. And I knew I'd have to break through a wall. There might be plumbing. What if there was plumbing and electrical in that wall? What I, was I going to do? And after a while, I learned, and I think this is an important point to keep in mind, is that a big job is nothing but a bunch of small jobs put together. And again, we get back to this point of don't let anything stop you. So that big job, you just start with the first part and have the resources ready, available, uh, so that when you hit that thing, when you open that wall and there's a pipe there, either you better know how to move it or you better know the guy who's call, who's going to get there the next day or in two days to move that pipe for you that you can pay to do the job. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about general mentoring that, you know, Diane touched on and SCORE does this. So in a way, some of what I'm talking about is what SCORE already does. And, and this is because many of us today are knowledge workers. We're not building houses, although many of us will. And we're gonna get into all the, the physical ways that you can uh, subcontract out work. But, but just the small things, you know, I often as a SCORE mentor provide clients with very simple things. To them, it's complicated. And to them, some of them are even holding back on, on growing their business or on starting their business. They're like, great, I don't know. Should I start an S corporation? Should I start an LLC? I'm worried about like paying my taxes. And, and very often in 15 minutes, a half hour, sometimes an hour, I often have PDFs that I've already made up for another client. And, and just by setting their mind at ease, just by telling them, don't worry about that. Concentrate on your business. Here's what you can do. You can you don't have to incorporate now. Here's the advantages, the disadvantages. And, and so SCORE is great in that fashion that you don't have to use them you know, once a week, once a month. Some, many of my clients, in fact, most of them tend to be short term and then maybe I hear from them in the future. So SCORE is a great resource for, for the knowledge worker. And of course there's other organizations uh, like your chamber of commerce, that can help you in, in your area. But now there's negatives to, or cons to the, the score end of things in that we, we, no matter how much we know, we, we are a limited crowdsource resource. And sometimes we're hyper-local, you know, we might have 90 members, 100 members, 50 members. Still, there's only X amount of information available. And in fact, I found myself this morning on a call with a client and I said, First thing I'm gonna do is call up my office and see if anybody knows more about uh, this particular subject than I do. And of course, I'm gonna reach out to my other people also. So now we're gonna get into some of the sites, some of the sites where what I would call subcontracted work or question and answer sites. And we're gonna start with the knowledge part of the situation. So some of you may have heard of Quora. It's a site that started around 2010. And I hung out there for quite a while back in the early days. The site was designed to try to answer all the world's questions. And a Quora would be a site where you might go on and ask a question and say, uh, how do I go about getting a Series A financing for my startup? And sure enough, you'll have people from Silicon Valley who are uh, venture capitalists, who are bankers, who are accountants, who can answer that question a heck of a lot better than, than I can, and probably better than anybody in my SCORE uh, office, because my SCORE office is a smaller Western Mass office. So, so you all of a sudden have a crowdsource, and Quora happens to be sort of a moderated uh, crowdsourced question and answer where if 20 people answer a particular question, uh, both the moderators themselves and the audience make it so that the better answers rise to the top. 
So I started answering a number of questions and I haven't been on there for quite a while, but just for uh, an interesting take, uh, since I'm interested in, in a lot of subjects, uh, I went back and I noticed that my answers had over a million views, um, which, you know, a million people decided to read them. Maybe a dozen or a few dozen of them got some help, especially from, uh, I have a number of them that might regard knowledge work, uh, WordPress, uh, marketing, advertising, monetizing sites, things like that. Here we can see, you know, everything from politics uh, to uh, my energy, uh, work in energy. People are asking me about electric water heaters and then about my, uh, my work in drones and things like that. I got a number of questions and you can see I got upvotes. That's how answers rise to the top. So Quora is sort of a, uh, a well-organized question and answer site. Not the only one, but I'm just giving one example here. There are many sites that provide questions and answers. But now one of the things about Quora that's interesting is so-called Quarans, if you're, if you're on Quora, you're a Quaran. Uh, so who's on here answering questions? Well, let's say you have a question about starting an online informational resource. Quora has a uh, feature that's called Ask to Answer, Ask to Answer. So people like myself, if I have a question about taxes, uh, I could go on and find the ultimate experts with the most views and taxes that look to me like, you know, they've worked for this firm and they've done this. And I can ask 10, 12 people just by clicking a box to answer plus the public. Well, here's Jimmy Wales, who is the founder of Wikipedia, and he's a well-known Quarren. So he answers a lot of questions on, on here. So you can see he has 60 million views. He's a top writer. So there's a number of people like that from, I remember when I was on, Eric Cantor, the Speaker of the House, uh, was on, as well as some other famous politicians and uh, a number of famous people in the online world. So this is more than just somebody somewhere answering your question. Quora tends to sort out some of the more knowledgeable people from the others. Now, Quora has gotten worse, I should say, in the last number of years, as like many online sites, people tend to find ways around it and to abuse it and things um, but you can still find what you need. You just have to sometimes dig through a little bit of mess. That's, you know, one of the downsides of online um, work is that you have to sometimes discern and make decisions of what's more BS and what's more truthful, you know, who are the people to listen to. But again, that's part of being a generalist, knowing what's correct. I can be pretty assured that if Jimmy Wales answers my question about something he knows about, it's going to be a good take. The same thing if I was going to start a classified site or I, I wanted to do something in the world uh, similar to that, uh, Craig Newmark, who is the founder of Craigslist, he's uh, on Quora. So somebody could ask him to answer a question. And these are just two examples. There are literally hundreds of people on here. I mean, if you wanna know how to design and create a central processor, uh, somebody on there is going to tell you that worked for Intel in processor development. Uh, and they're gonna be on there and they're gonna tell you how it's done or show you how it's done. So that's the depth that you could get to. On the other end, if you wanna know how to monetize a site, anything of that nature, you're gonna be able to find some links to it or some information on Quora. Now, interestingly enough, Quora circles right back to SCORE. I took a look on Quora at some questions and answers and found that a number of SCORE mentors are on there. But due to our code of ethics and due to our hyper-local situation and you know, due to the fact that a lot of SCORE mentors that are active, they're not gonna be running around everywhere else giving advice because they're concentrated on their score clients. There are a number of, of people on here who are telling people that are asking questions, hey, do you know about score? Go to score. 
So if you're in the USA, get a score mentor. So it circles right back and, and one thing feeds another. So if somebody asks a question on Quora that might be more local, somebody's going to tell them, call your local score or go to national score, see if you have a local one. I find that that's pretty interesting. So, so you know, question that's asked is, well, how about social media for answers? My first advice would be no, no, no. There's always exceptions to every rule, but uh, Facebook, Twitter, any of these type of things, text, no, no, no. Mostly it has to do with the design, the layout. Um, these places are not set up for uh, figuring out who is who. They're not set up for proper searching. They're not set up for pop proper threading, proper archiving and such. So in general, I would stay away from social media for most of my answers and use uh, the, some of the sites that I will show you, true contracted work sites, or use Quora, Score, you know, for free mentoring. One exception is certain forums, like the forum I mentioned that I started a, a brain dump forum that happens to be on wood stoves and fireplaces and related things. There are some great forums on the internet, and forums were one of the earliest and still one of the best ways in getting into specialty subjects. If, if your new business involves um, restoring old Boston whalers or restoring old Corvettes, uh, I would say get information in forums. You can find a lot of very, very specific. And again, by the, num by the amount of time reputation matters, the amount of time the people you're reading have been on there, how many answers they've given, their reputations. So old style forums, in my opinion, have never gone out of style. It's been a question that's been asked regularly. People are, are forums dead? You'll find that on Quora. People are saying, are forums dead because of social media? My answer is no. If you're looking to chat, go to social media. If you're looking to criticize, go to social media. You know, if you're looking for attention, go to social media. But if you're learning, looking to learn things, then perhaps an old style forum might do the job. So I wanted to mention that, that the forums and Quora and all this, reputation matters. The original concept of the internet, which I was sort of involved in, we didn't even think about making money. Money had nothing to do with it. The word monetization had not even existed. There wasn't even such a thing as, as these ad networks and all this kind of stuff. Forget about that. People were, it was about all about reputation. It was all about, did you really provide the person with the information that they needed or wanted? And therefore the network effect would come into play. The more you give, the more you get. And Google, for instance, was founded on that. They were founded on, let's do the best possible job that we can do in guiding people to what's there. So I would caution people. Sometimes I, I meet people that are you know, into uh, doing jobs on the internet and I can tell right away they're in a sort of a multi-level marketing frame of mind. Uh, or a sales frame of mind. I would tell people that they'll do better to be in a, a give more, get more frame of mind, to be in a try to be a part of helping people and it, it comes back on you. And that can be everything from being involved in Quora, not only to ask questions, but to use your knowledge to help others. And even as simple of a thing as giving honest reviews on Amazon and eBay. Every time you give somebody a false review or you give somebody reviews, you know, to fake it because they're a friend of yours or because they asked you or they sent you something in the mail that said they'll give you a, a free prize. In a way, you are uh, spreading something that is not useful to people that maybe tells them a product that's better than it is. So I know it's old fashioned, but a lot of the Internet came around due to this. Uh, reputation of people helping other people. So I'm going to move on to some 
to the men from the knowledge work, mentoring and general advice to real world examples of some subcontracted work I've done and completed projects. So a number of years ago, I thought of a physical invention when I was in the wood stove business. And this happened to be a device that would extend chimneys. Now, those of you who have seen a number of chimneys know that this thing is on the left is called a chimney pot, but I have a different name for it. I call it a chimney extension. A taller chimney works better. So therefore I came up with the idea of chimney extensions, but instead of weighing 250 pounds and being built out of clay where you'd need a crane to crank it up there, it would be UPSable, shippable, uh, easily installed, lightweight, manufactured uh, for less money. So I came up with this idea. I had it patented and I started this company, uh, made up a few prototypes. That's a trade show booth on the right. But I wanted to give a quick example of how I, somebody who knows nothing about metal work other than looking at the stoves that I sold and being a carpenter, so maybe working with a little aluminum siding, um, so I'm gonna start with a very simple version of this. I came up with this little thing on the left when I found out that the, the code, the fire codes say that two chimneys cannot terminate at the same height. If you have two chimneys next to each other, one has to terminate higher than the other. In this case, it's so that smoke doesn't come out of one and go down the other when chimneys aren't in use they often downdraft. So smoke can easily come out of one chimney and go down another. So I found this part in the code and I thought, oh, I can make this using my same patent. I can make this inexpensive uh, thing to extend the chimney cap up higher above another one. So how did I go about making this? Well, I went to guru.com, which is one of the contracted work websites. There are a number of them. At, at the time I did this, there was one called contractedwork.com. There's guru.com. We'll talk a little bit about Fiverr. But of course, these are going to change as the years go by. One is going to be more popular than another. But they basically all do the same thing. They basically give you access to freelancers. So here I needed... I had made up a little prototype on some inexpensive tools I had of what this thing was, but that's all I had. I needed to, in order to get them made or to get prices, I needed to have drawings. So I found somebody who did computer-aided design on um, guru.com, and I sent out uh, a couple requests sort of for bids. And I told these people what I had. I said, I have basic measurements. And I made up a quick one. It's nothing exact, but I can send that to you, UPS, and I can send you my ideas. And if you could make drawings, and here's just one small part of the drawings that they provided me with, uh, to give you some kind of an idea, my guess is that it was about a hundred dollars for a complete set of drawings for all the parts for that sheet metal. And these drawings would allow anybody of skill to give me uh, a quote on the unit and also would allow people with uh, more sophisticated operations to actually enter these into programs and have machines automatically cut them, fold them, bend them, and do all of that kind of a work. So here for my own time, my own research and $100, I'm all ready to having a full set of drawings. So once I had the drawings, I got a number of prices. They were too high. Um, I got them locally here in the US. Lo and behold, at about the same time, I had gotten an email. And some of you may get these emails. You might call them spam. This one didn't happen to be spam. It was from a place in China that just said, oh, if you're interested, we make some of you have probably gotten ones like this. We make this, we make that, we make castings, we make this. If you want it, send us, uh, send us your information and maybe we can make something for you. So I had gotten one of those and this particular one mentioned chimney caps. We make chimney caps. So I sent an email and I ended up having an exchange with a gentleman with a small startup sheet metal company in China and I said, look, I need these sheet metal things done. I have the drawings. 
And he said, well, we can do that for you, Craig. And I said, but look, I've got no market for these. I'm, I'm just me. I'm not a big company. I'm not promising you anything. He said, look, every company starts out small. As long as you pay the tooling costs and you pay the costs, we're willing to deal with you. I said, great. So I sent him the drawings and I also sent him the prototype. Well, actually I didn't send him the prototype. I sent him the drawings and told him to send me a prototype. So he took the drawings and he sent me a prototype based on the drawings. This is then a further exchange. I got the prototype. I described, I said, oh, move this a little to the left, move this a little to the right. You know, here's a little difference in what I want. And then he sent me back this. It happened to be a Word document and an email. And he said, oh, you know, what about this? And you can see, dear Craig, do we misunderstand you? Do we need to add it in sideways? So we had this small exchange. And again, this was very part time. He took it, made up another prototype. The second prototype he sent me was perfect. Um, we ended up making, he then ended up making hundreds of them for me, which were perfect, shipped them to me. So long story short, I ended up selling this company, but I sold a lot of, of, of these units. I sold a couple hundred thousand dollars worth enough to get my investment back. I won't fool anybody and say that I made money on this. It was fun. I learned a lot and I didn't get paid for my time, but I got most of my investment back. But if the, the key here is if I would have wanted 100,000 of those, I had the tooling made, he could have provided them to me in the space of a month or two. I also made more sophisticated uh, ones, as you saw in some of those early pictures. These were made out of cast aluminum, and these were done in much the some, same way. Costs were higher because we're making a more detailed product. So obviously the cost for making molds and things like that. And in this case, I had some friends of mine who I knew from the stove business who had designed uh, wood stoves for some companies. And I reached out to them and I said, can you do some of the original design work? So I was dealing with an American, two American engineers who then were dealing with a pattern shop who then were dealing with a Chinese foundry and an agent to make these. And these also, I brought in a few containers worth of the finished product, um, sold them. And, it, you know, it's quite a, it, it, for somebody who's a novice who never made anything of this sort uh, ever, um, it was a challenging project and I ended up getting it done. So again, it proves that if you, if I would have had the market for it, frankly, the reason I decided to sell it was once I started, I had already been out of any physical business. I was doing the internet work and I found that I didn't want to get back in the physical work. After I started getting a couple phone calls from customers, I made a decision. I do not want to do that again. I already had five lines ringing, warehouses dealt with it. I was like, didn't want to do that. So I sold this company. But the key here is a full line was created using contracted work. Now, of course, the same thing applies to websites. And because I had a successful a website for 18 years, the, the first one about the uh, wood stoves, hearth.com. Uh, occasionally I would need customizations do it, done and I could have sat around for hours and learned every little aspect of it. But I found people that uh, there was a one service that would do, they, they were called Genesis Tweaks and Genesis happens to be a template for WordPress and they did anything for $20. So it was $20 to do anything. So if I needed, you know, some markup done or, or something of that sort, I would just email Justin, I remember his name, and you would PayPal him $20. And there he goes, he would do the work for me. Well, at $20, you know, I mean, I like learning things for the heck of it. And I learned how to administer websites, do servers, do SQL, do everything else. But there comes a time where you just want something done. And of course, when it comes to the web, you can find people to do it online. Now, one of the jobs that I had to do, this is a picture of 
a little later in the game of, of hearth.com, my larger website in the early days, which ran a number of forums. And the forums were the place where we had, um, at the time, well over a million posts uh, on it. And it was an information resource. We had knowledge base questions and answers. And there came a time when the system, the forums and things that I had became dated and the company was no longer supporting them and making them. So here I had millions of posts and tens of thousands of uh, users that I had to bring over to a new um, content management system, a new forum. And there was no tools to do it. There was no importing facilities. There was nobody. So I, I went crazy on the web trying to find out how people did it. I finally found one person ever that did it, and that really didn't help me much. So I went to the forum that was about the new forum software that I was using, and I started hanging out there for a while. I wasn't using this software yet. I was intending to, and I saw that this brilliant kid, he must have been about 22, and he was one of the moderators on that site. And he was giving away plugins and giving away uh, services for free. It was like, here, here's something that does this. Here's something that does that. So I reached out to him. I said, Jake, I've got to do this incredibly difficult job of moving these 1.3 million posts. Well, long story short, between Jake and myself, he insisted on doing it for no money. I insisted on paying him a couple thousand dollars. I think I ended up maybe paying him as much as $4,000, which was nothing considering what hearth.com made. We ended up transferring our entire site to this new software with not a single burp, not. And in fact, one of my main moderators, who was the IT director for ExxonMobil for his career, he said he never saw ever anybody ever move legacy software in that amount and in that style without having problems. So this is, again, another example of seeking out the person, the people who can do things. Sometimes it's for free. I should say on my site, my moderators all worked for free for years. They're still working. This is still working after 20 years, even after I sold the site, uh, doing incredible work for free. Again, I pay them every year. I would send them, send them money that they didn't ask for. So yes, this was the, this is a picture of the newer forum. Once we moved it, we moved it to Zen 4.0 software from an old software, which was called Expression Engine or P Machine. But there was no, and there still is no way of doing that. We had to do it piece by piece, which is very difficult for anybody who knows how this stuff works. This is, happens to be a page for hearth.com, which is, uh, shows some of the statistics. So you can get an idea, uh, 20 million pages read in 2013. So we were doing this all hot. You know, uh, we were, while hearth.com was running, I was also having another site set up, moving the stuff. And then one day I said, okay, time to switch over to the new site. And we had to do that. And for, I'm sort of proud of, the, of Jake, he's the smart one, uh, being able to do this all and have no burps at all. It's such a large site. To give you an idea, at the time, our site was rated right up there with Zipcar, uh, the North Face, in terms of readership. So in terms of where we sat in rankings, we were up there with the big guys. So another um, site that I did, I mentioned the books. I got into drone journalism, which is flying cameras. And this logo here, um, I'm not very good at drawing things. There came a time I wanted a logo. So what I did was went to another contracted work site. Some of you may have heard of or used Fiverr. Uh, the idea of Fiverr being that it's supposed to cost you only $5 to get anything done. And when I say you can get anything done, I mean just about anything. So I went and um, I found a couple of people that had good reputations for doing logos. And the first person that I had do it, tell you the truth, I didn't like the logo. Well, it set me back all of $20. So I just threw that one away. The second person, 
I like the logo. It was $35. So I'm $55 into my logo. And I had my drone flyer logo in all sorts of formats. I used it when I went to uh, the computer electronics show for t-shirts, for hats that I both gave out. I used it on my site. I used it on my books. I think most people who have had experience in graphic design, they might say not the greatest logo in the world, but they also might say adequate and $55 isn't bad. And that in the case of journalism, what was important really was having it, having it done. And of course, the content of the site. Now, when I say you can get anything done on Fiverr, I mean anything. One of the things we were going to do on our, this is on a personal level, but it would apply whether you're doing it commercially or however. Um, we decided to put a carport on our little mid-century modern house here in Sarasota. And I sort of made the decision by myself, but knowing my wife and the way she takes pride in the way our house looks, uh, I figured if I stuck up this carport and it ended up looking terrible, I was gonna be in trouble. So I went on to Fiverr and I found somebody that did 3D drawing and I said, well, what's it gonna to cost to get uh, renderings done of how it might look with this carport? Well, the cost was again, somewhere in the area of $25, $35. I sent them some pictures of the house as it is. I sent them a picture from what, what these carports look like. They're very simple aluminum structures. And I got back these two pictures, which I showed to my wife. And the carport looks exactly like that. And it fits perfectly with the house and with Sarasota. So, you know, that's an example of like just almost anything that you need done. And while I was doing this, we were also doing the back porch. And I had another problem. We were extending the back porch and the contractor wanted to remove a lot of the uprights uh, that were supporting the original porch. At, there was about six of them. And he said, we'll take them all out except for the two on the ends and one in the middle. And I looked at it as a carpenter and I said, ah, it doesn't look right to me. That doesn't, I don't think it can span that far. And he said, Craig, the plans are stamped. Sarasota building says, okay, believe me, it's okay. And I didn't believe him. So I went on Fiverr and I found a structural engineer who had a license and I looked at a lot of the other work he had done. And again, $20, $25, he said, he'll look at any problem. I sent him the information and the next day or two days later, he sent back, he checked all the engineering calculations and he said, yes, Craig, you're wrong for suspecting it. That will hold up. And again, the reason in Florida that it holds up is because all loads in Florida are the other way. We don't have snow loads or multiple layers of shingles and other types of loads that they have up north. Loads here are mostly the other way. So if it holds up in the first place, it pretty much holds up forever. It doesn't sag from its own weight. But he sent me the engineering calculations and I was able to, for myself, satisfy. And I was 90% sure it was wrong, just from my own experience. But it shows the advantage of having instant access to online contracted work. So that's gonna be the end of, of my examples, real world examples. I hope you've seen some of the ways that you can use both uh, knowledge advice, you can get knowledge advice and you can get real world advice so that nothing can stop you on your way uh, from here to there. And I missed one, but it was thank you. Um, and my time, I think, is starting to run short. So I'm going to ask Diane or any of you uh, if there's any questions that came up or comments, uh, I'd be glad to answer them. Well, that was very interesting, Craig. Let me turn on my video. That was very interesting. And I think that bringing in your real world experience and examples was quite helpful. There are so many, uh, also, there are also so many other um, examples of this uh, out there. I'm sure that you know of uh, writing um, sites. Uh, many of my clients, I suggest that 
they put Q and A's or they put uh, blogs on their websites and they say, well, I'm not a great writer. Okay, but there are people who, who are good writers. All you have to do is give them a topic and pay them a little bit of money and ta-da, you've got a, a, uh, uh, something that you can post. Have you experienced that? Actually, my niece is does exactly that. <laughs> she is a communications and she writes. So she started services doing that. And of course, the beauty of it is that you can do that either for a one time thing. So you could get something done for 50 or $100 on Fiverr for the one page you need once. Or you could hire somebody like Alice, my my niece, who would uh, arrange that if you need it on a continual basis, perhaps you need some PR, you need continuing writing about things that you're doing about your business as things change. So again, you, you almost have a perfect example of where you don't need too much help, just enough, you know, so that's where the efficiency, the efficiency expert part comes in. Absolutely. Well, we have no uh, open questions. No one has asked a question. I've looked in the chat. Uh, a lot of people are telling you uh, good presentation. Nice. Thank you. Um, so let's wrap this up. If you would click once. I just want to reinforce uh, that I'd like people to visit our website, minnesota.score.org. If you don't have a mentor, please apply for one. Craig could be your mentor, who knows? Though he is not in our chapter, he is uh, visiting us uh, in Florida. For whatever reason, people in the Northeast tend to come to Florida for the winter. We haven't figured that out yet. Uh, must be something less than wonderful in the Northeast this time of year. But we thank uh, Craig for sharing his knowledge. If you would like to give back, maybe you would like to be a, a SCORE mentor. Maybe you realized after listening to this that you have a lot of knowledge that you could share. Go to our website and click on volunteer. You want to have a mentor, you can apply for that. Check out our other websites, uh, our other uh, workshops, and our other recorded information. And lastly, if you could click one more time, Craig, I think we have one more. You will be receiving a survey. It would be great if you could just take a moment to fill it in. There are two really important questions. What can we improve and what other topics are you interested in? As the education chair, I'm always open to suggestion. And then we'll find wonderful presenters like Craig who can uh, present the topic for us. So if you get this, when you get this, this will be coming from our headquarters, our national, and uh, if you could spend just a moment filling it in, you'll be asked to rate Craig's presentation on a one to 10 scale with 10 being the best. So we hope that uh, you think that uh, <laughs> Craig is at, at minimum a nine, but certainly a 10. All right. Well, I think he is uh, voting for you, helping you. Numbers. I'm not sure. Don't do it if you don't feel it, right? Exactly. Be honest. You said in your presentation, be honest with your reviews. So be honest. Uh, uh, Georgia said you are definitely a 10. So let's let's hope that's reflected. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. I uh, look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar. We have weekly webinars. Uh, because you have attended this, you will be receiving updates on it. Again, you'll be receiving all of these slides as well as a link to the video. So thank you all for coming. See you again. Thank you, Craig. Thank Bye -bye. you.